Hello and welcome to the class today. Today we're going to be painting a bokeh effect. So bokeh is basically that out of focus backgrounds that you often see in photographs. It works really well for paintings and stuff as well. So I want to show you how to paint that. It's not that difficult, a little bit of a process to it. So let me show you, explain to you what bokeh is. I'll show you a few examples and then we'll take it from. Okay, so a bokeh effect is an out of focus blurry background so what happens is it's a aberration that happens with your camera it's got something to do with the lens it gets like a, a, f a lens flare or whatever at at a certain focus focal distance then those light points in the background flare up and become round dots like that so the word actually comes from a japanese word called bokeh which means blur or out of focus so it's b-o-k-e in uh japanese in english it's b-o-k-e-h so there's two ways you can pronounce it in english you can say bokeh or you can say bokeh so I'm not going to say bouquet because then you get confused with uh, a bouquet of flowers. So I'm going to be just be calling it bokeh. That's going to be my my preferred way of saying it. But you can obviously say bokeh or you can say bouquet as well. They're all correct. All right, so let's go to this photo over here. There you can see that these little aberrations, these little circles or dots, generally they're the same size but it's all dependent on distance so you can see that these guys over here are smaller bokeh effect there's larger larger and larger as they go back into the distance so let's maybe go to back to this guy over here can you see there all the all the dots tend to be roughly the same size and that's simply because whatever is in the distance is at that one specific distance. And here's another interesting thing, and that is that your bokeh effect doesn't need to be a perfect circle. You can actually get, I, I couldn't find a photo, um, but you can actually get like hexagonal shapes and stuff your camera itself has like a, 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 a shutter like metal shutter flaps or arms or whatever you want to call them that open and close depending on how you how you've set your camera settings so those little goodies there can affect the shape of these dots in the background so that they become not just circles they become hexagonals and stuff so you'll actually find some uh, photographers will even use shapes like hearts or whatever and put it on the outside edge of the of the camera lens so that when they do um, do that focal effect then the bokeh effect of the background actually becomes hearts or whatever so it's quite clever eh? how the guys do that so now i want to show you how handy this effect is so let's just show down some of these guys we've done with yeah patrick is saying it's the aperture that you set well there you go sadly i know nothing about photography <laughs> so let's take a look at this this photo over here And let's go play around a bit. It's a, it's a, do you, do you agree with me? It's an absolute awesome scene. But there's a lot of things happening, especially those busy curtains in the background. So if you had to paint it like this, it'll look good, but you can make it look better by applying the bokeh effect in the background. Right, so we, it's, I'm just going to play around and I'm going to show you what it looks like and then eventually I'll show you how we do it. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to gradually apply that bokeh effect to the background. And as I do that, can you see how the little boy is standing out so much better now? Then let's zoom back. See there versus anywhere along there. Much better. Now you know that little boy is the focal point. Especially, let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe you're painting it like that. Okay, now let's go and take that, that bokeh effect away. See there, can you see how those curtains really compete with the, with the boy and even the, this little cute little elephant over there. It really competes for attention. So if you can apply the bokeh effect in the background like that, to just push everything out of fo focus, you have so much nicer paintings. Alright, so let me go and show you how I do this on the computer. So if you do have software, you may not have the same one as mine, and that doesn't matter. Then you can do that yourself. So I've got this. This is a, a typical situation that you'll get. You'll get somebody coming to you and say, um, Here's my dog. I've taken this lovely photo. Can you please paint him? And you'll say, yeah, sure. <laughs> but now you're sitting with a problem with that background is incredibly busy. So what you need to do now is uh, just get rid of that background. So you can do that by applying the bokeh effect. So it is already out of focus, but you'd need to push it more out of focus. Because can you see they've got lots and lots of detail still in the back. So Christy's asking what uh, software am I using? I am using Affinity Photo. But all the all the good softwares will have exactly the same effect that I've got. So whatever software you're using, it will be there. All right, so I'm going to just start off by copying this whole image. And I'm going to paste that down there. So that I've got a second version of it. Now I'm going to go and just remove the dog. Now you don't have to do that. But I just find I'll get a better outline. So I'll tell you now. I can't leave my mouse. But I'll tell you now what's what is this effect that I'm using or well, what tool is this that I'm using I think it's called in painting if I remember correct so what this basically does is it just uh, it uses artificial intelligence and takes whatever you're selecting here and it replaces it with whatever it sees in the background. So I'll just gradually color this guy in. Him disappear. The idea of there is just that I can isolate the background. You don't have to do this. You can apply the bokeh effect to the whole thing on the second layer. But I just find you get a better, better result. Yes, yeah, so it's called an in-painting brush. All right. So now we've got basically just our background. So now what we're going to do is apply that um, that effect, the, the bokeh effect, to the background. 
So I'm going to use the blur and the maximum blur function. And I'm going to make sure that the setting is set to circular. And I'm going to just push it along. So now you can decide how, um, how much of the bokeh effect do you want? Really out of focus or, or less? So in this case, I think we'll, we'll just push it all the way. We can always go and play with it again afterwards. Okay, so let's go and add our dog back in again. So I'm going to do this and I'm just going to create a mask on this layer here. So that we can, we can bring our dog back. So somebody's asking, why am I doing this? Why, why are we not painting it? We will paint. Um, I want to show you how you can do it on your computer because that, that's, it's, a, it's a handy skill to have. If you've got the software that allows you to, to, to do this and then you don't have to try and imagine it, you can picture it. Okay, so now let's go and play. What it looks like now with the bokeh effect versus what it looked like before. Can you see how much better your uh, your dog is standing out now? So can you see how that bokeh effect can really help you a hang of a lot? When you're painting like this. Alright, so the photo that we're painting today is this guy over here. It's nice and simple. I, I kept the, the things in the foreground to an absolute minimum because we, we want to paint the background. Alrighty, so let's go over to the canvas. So I'm working on a 400 by 300 millimeter canvas today, which is essentially a 16 by 12 inch canvas. So if, if you're a patron, you can also go and download this uh, tiled reference and the tiled sketch template. All right, so what I'm basically going to do, when I paint the bokeh effect, there's two steps to it. The first step is the background itself, ignoring the, the, the flare effect. Let's call this the flare effect. <laughs> So we'll, we'll paint the background first, ignoring all the flares, and then you come back in when the background is dry, and then you add these little lens flares in. So that's what we're going to do now. So I've got my, my palette over here, and you can see the, the reference photo over there. So for now, I'm not going to sketch out the, the flower. Um, I think today I'll just do my own thing. It's... It's not about the flower, it's about the background. All right, so let's take a look. What colors do we see there in the background? I've got some, definitely some greens there. So I'll put down a bit of sap green. There's whites. So we'll put down some white. And then there's like yellowy orangey kind of colors, eh? So maybe we can put down some. Maybe some yellow ochre. And there's brighter yellows in that top left hand corner there. So that would be some cadmium yellow. And maybe the cadmium yellow and the yellow ochre together would give that orangey kind of color there. 
then there is a bit of a, a pinkiness in, in this vicinity, eh? Around here. So what can we use for that? Maybe just a, a touch of crimson or maybe maybe a cadmium red. There's not much. So I'll just put down a little speck of that. So if you do want to do this effect in oil, you're going to stop at the point before we add these little flares. Otherwise, you do it mostly the same. I'll explain the differences as I go along. So just to reiterate, I am working in, in acrylic today. So I'm going to take just a nice big, big brush because we need to cover this canvas as quickly as possible. So now let's say, for example, whatever you've got in front here, let's say you wanted to paint this flower exactly as is. Then what I would probably do, it's, it's better to sketch him out now and then use the, the clear cover to mask him off. So we'll start with lots of water in the paint. So I'll start, say, with some, some sap green. All right, so I'm seeing some greens in this vicinity. So I'm just going to scrub it in. The idea with this first layer now is just to get rid of the, the white of the canvas. I can see leaves and things going out in this direction, so I'm just using a, a, a rough scrubbing motion in that direction there like that. All right, so over here, I'll just, again, I'm just dipping my brush inside the water and we just pick up some paint so it's very very loose so i'm just estimating where stuff is remember things in in the background are out of focus so what happens is All we need to do is just put down roughly what we see in the correct places for now. So here there's some little darker bits and so on. So now I'm going to just take some neat tab green without the without the water in it I'm just going to work some of these guys in there now I'm holding the brush really flat because when things are out of focus the big trick there is to have no hard edges in whatever you're painting Oh, in the background. It must just be the one color flowing into the next. So I'm just for now putting stuff down there just to get some movement. All right, I think that's okay there for now. Let's maybe just take some white, let's get some water into that, and just get some some white down here in between those guys over there. Yeah, that should be fine. So now that we've got the, the canvas covered, 
I'm going to dry this off. Alrighty. So the idea now is it looks like a dog's breakfast, doesn't it? <laughs> but the idea now is it's just given us a base to work from. So now we're going to start blending all these guys and getting these colors a bit more accurate according to what we see them. So there are some duller greens in here. So I think I'll just take some raw umber. Let's put some raw umber down there. And we use that in the, into the sap green to, to dull the sap green down. So you can keep the paint nice and dry or nice and wet. Sharon is asking, do I always use water to um, thin my paints? Yes, I just use water. And then Scar's asking, uh, will a sable round marked for acrylic work for watercolor? It should. It should. The watercolor guys just tend to have really soft head brushes so that it can hold lots of lots of paint. Alright, so now I'm just going to work up a bit more of that stripey effect. But I'm careful as I do that to not get hard edges. So I'm going to put down, for example, a line over there. And then I'm just going to work away the edges like that. So I'll just use the tip of the brush for that effect. Here on this side it's more like a grey, so I'll just bring some of the the white into these colours. Um, I might know I've never attempted to make my own acrylics. There's uh, there's guys that do that for a living. I will leave it to them. Uh, it's much more fun painting than uh, <laughs> I'm sure than making the paint. <laughs> I leave that work to them. So as I as I do this, I want you to try and picture what I'm seeing. Can you see the the color that I'm putting down? As I put it down, I'm working it away, working it in. So Marina uh, um, is suggesting keeping a, a separate set of paints for your acrylics versus for your watercolors. And I, I tend to agree with that one. Um, I do, however, use the same set of brushes for my oil and my acrylics. They, they, they share the same set of brushes. Let's maybe bring some yellow into this corner here. What I also like to do with the work effect is to make sure the background isn't too light. Because when you bring in these, the flare effect, if your background is too light, then it doesn't, it just simply doesn't stand out. I'm actually seeing a little bit of a bluish in this vicinity but I don't think I'm going to put it in I'll just lighten that up so 
So if you were working now in oils, then you would just simply move this paint around with very gentle strokes until you've made sure that you've got no, no hard edges. And if you're working in acrylics, then just give it as many layers as you as you need. So let's say, for example, if you've got a, a hard edge over there, then just come back in with a with another layer, put it next to it, and then just carefully work over where those two meet. until that hard edge is gone. Here's a bit of dark in this vicinity here as well. It almost seems a bit of browny kind of colors there as well. So I'll put that in. And up here, there's also some darks Way out in this vicinity over here. So I'll put that in. It doesn't need to be exact. Just use the the photo as a as a guide. Uh, Camelish, yes, I am using the I am using sap green. Oh, can sap green be made? Yeah, you can use uh, I would say some ultramarine and some yellow ochre should get you very close to a close to a sap green. Do that. That. So I'll start with the yellow and gradually bring in some some blue I'll get you close get you close but you should always have uh, some 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 form of a green in your in your set of paints, so let's say for example you had a, maybe a, a, a green light, something like that, that was maybe just too bright or whatever, then you can always just turn it down with a bit of uh, bit the opposite color. Alright, let's go down to some just using whites, so I'll pull the whites out that side. So there is water in it, not tons like that initial layer. And now we've got like flowers in the background there, right? Eh? So I'm going to just start just roughly plotting out where those where those flowers are. Roughly. So all I can see is we've got like roundish shapes. My shapes may not end up the same as as on the photo. It's not going to matter. I've got the effect, and that's good enough. There, we need a few more little. Little dots, eh? So I'll leave just space for those dots. That's fine. Down. But now before they before they dry, just wipe the excess off. Just on your paper towel. So that you've got a mostly clean brush, clean dry brush. And just gently come back in. I'll just use that little corner of the brush over there. Just that. Just to soften these edges. Maybe we can't have any hard edges. Just very gentle. Soften those edges. You can even sometimes, if that paint is 
still nice and wet. I'll even use my finger to to get rid of that hard edge. It does a great job of blending, actually. Your finger, just keep uh, cleaning it every now and again. Yeah, Hooker's Green is also a nice one to, to have. He works great. I sort of just happen to standardize on, on the sap green. Because when Dennis got me started with the painting, he gave me a he gave me sap green. So you just sort of stick with it. <laughs> Okay, so here, so you can see there is that bokeh effect on these guys in the background. So that's why I am working in a, in a bit of a, a roundish motion to make sure, everything, make sure everything is sort of round. Here, I'm just going to mist all this out as well over there. You don't don't want any hard edges. No hard edges. Let's bring this down a little bit further over there. Oh, it's in this vicinity over here. Let's get some yellow, some nice yellows over here. And I'm just going to use circular motions and just, just get these guys Also, just roughly put in, softening up any edges I see. Let's maybe take some yellow ochre and cadmium yellow mixed. Let's bring them down in this vicinity over here. So you can see my my painting is. Heading in the same direction, you, you'll you can recognize the the scene and the and the the shapes, the abstract shapes in the background. But it's not it's not identical, and and that doesn't matter. Um, I also have him in the in my bag of tricks because he works great for for seascapes, and you can quickly make a sap green out of um, out of viridian. You take your viridian and then you add some uh, raw umber into it, and that also gives you a sap green. All right, so let's get some of those white guys in front there. Right, so now go over and, and just check. Check for hard edges. For example, over here, I can see there's a little bit of a hard edge. So I'm just going to tap him out. Yeah, Viridian is a great colour on its own as well, eh? There, we said we had a little bit of pink. Hey, I've forgotten about that. So we've got that bit of red over there. And then it's nick some, some white. 
So that's obviously another another tulip that's out there in, in the distance. So let's add some of that in over there as well. Just roughly in that in that vicinity. I'll just soften all those edges. The hard edges. Um, Peter, the program I used in the beginning is Affinity Photo, but all your um, all your software that you get, the good ones that have that can do ed photo editing, will have that blur feature. So you don't have to use the same software as me. And obviously, once you understand the concept like we're doing now, you don't need the software at all. It's just a way that you can, I just thought I'd show you how you can um, do it on the computer. Because sometimes people battle to, to visualize it. And as you can see, if you can do it on the computer like that, like we were doing with the, the little boy and even the dog, it allows you to play a little bit with different options. And it's not so easy to play with all these little options in your head. So if you can quickly do it on the computer, you saw it only took a few seconds to, to, to blur that background and, uh, and, and create that bokeh effect. So if you know how to do it, 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 it frees you up and it allows you to play and, and with different little options before you put paint on canvas as part of your as part of your planning. Right, so I'm just strengthening this up over here. It hasn't quite got enough depth here yet. And as I go, I'm just checking that I don't have any crazy hard edges or anything like that. And you can also see my colors also aren't identical. They're close, and that's usually good enough. So Brenda is asking, is this a dry brush technique? Absolutely, absolutely. At this stage, though, I'm not really adding any, any more water into the mix. We'll use some of this uh, mixed sap green as well while, while we're at it. <laughs> it's lying there. Oh, I think that's good enough. All right, so I'm going to dry this all off now. So this is where, again, if you're painting in oil, you would need to stop. Where up to this point, you could have just continued. So that is another one advantage with, with acrylic. You know, if you after you've dried this off, you uh, you feel that you could still need to touch up somewhere, then absolutely go for it all right now we need to add these bokeh flares so what i'm going to do i think here on the palette i'm just going to clear off an area so let's just take some some paper dip it in the water and let's just clear this little area off over here just so that we can work with some whites and lighter colors without them getting contaminated. My area on the top there is a little bit full now. Um, okay, is asking would zinc white, would, would that be a bit more translucent? It sure would be. If you want a more um, 
transparent white and you can use that or you can use what's called a tinting white there we go all right so now we can just take even this i'll just put it down there for now i think let me give my palette a, a mist then those paints over there won't dry for in case we need them i don't anticipate using them again but you never know Okay, now I'm going to take a softer brush. So this is just a, a flat, soft brush. You can use any... You can technically use a, a bristle brush like this as well. I'm sure it'll work. I just find the, the soft brush just fills in the, the effect better. And then Brenda's asking, what kind of palette is this? It's just a... Old ceramic tile. That's all I use. I use the. I've got a ceramic tile. I've got a few of them, and I've got little feet that I got at the dollar store, and that works fabulously. Cleans easily, as well. Okay, so now let's go back to the photo, just for a short while. And let's go and have a closer look at those flares. Can you see that they are slightly transparent? So then I also want you to notice that they aren't all equally transparent. Some are more and some are less. So that's pretty cool. We, we know that generally they the same size. So I, I generally tend to keep them the same size unless you've got uh, those distinct distances like we had with this guy. Yeah, we had those those little Christmas decorations. Oh, you can see they're going receding into the distance. So that's why you've got those different f places where it's flaring less, I closer by, and then more, more and more as you go back into the distance but here yeah in general you're going to keep them just the same size that works fine so there's several ways that you can do this when you when you're painting if you've got the time then uh you can create yourself little little cutouts like this. So you can buy um, those little circle templates from the, the drafting kind of companies or really nice uh, stationery stores. What I've used over here is just an old milk bottle. So you just take a, shove your, your craft knife into there just to create a, a hole. And then you just cut all the way along there. And you can do the same over there and there and there. And now you've got yourself a few little gadgets that you can make these little masks out of. And then you can use all sorts of different, anything that's around. So you place that on there. Use a, a Sharpie. You can draw around that, and then you take your craft knife, shove a hole through the center, and then use your scissors and carefully cut all the way around the center. So don't worry about cutting it perfect. Remember, we have saw on the photos that these circles don't need to be perfect circles. Some of them are more oval and so on. So you can, you can make a few with different, different sizes if you want. So sadly, these ones that I've got are now too small for, for this painting. The, the size of these um, flares on here are larger. So I'm just going to do them by hand. I'm not going to use a mask at all. So what you will find, though, is that these um, flares, can you see the edges tend to be quite 
hard or pronounced. For example, if you look at this guy over here, look there, even that, that edge is, is less transparent than the inside. This guy as well, it's less transparent than the inside. And there's another example in that top corner, top center as well. So what I do when I'm painting these guys is I will just start on the outside and then I work my way in. If the paint dies on me on the way in, then so be it. I've got my outside edge, which is the most important. Then it just means the inside is a little bit more transparent. All right, so I'm going to pick up just a little bit of paint. Just like that. And now you can vary these circles. Simply by varying the amount of paint you've got on the brush. So I'm going to start with this big prominent guy over here. I'll start on that outside bit over there like that. And I'm going to circle my way in. So as you go, you're going to just gradually get him all around as you go along. All right, so I'm going to just start with a bunch of these guys. Needless to say, you need some that are going out the picture as well. So another thing that I've also noticed with these flares is that they tend to sort of group together. Okay, now we can start doing a few that are a little bit more transparent. So what I'll do is I've got a cloth and I just, as I, as I need to, I just wipe off any excess like that. So I, I just keep the cloth here on my lap. And that way you get the, the more transparent ones as well. Then these flares all depend on what what is it that's flaring. So their, their color can be different. For example, here by the yellow guys, you can take some of this and add a bit of yellow into it. And you can add some yellow flares in that area over there. Let's get some bit of pinker ones for this area over here. Yeah, I've got almost no paint on the on the brush to give me a nice transparent one. 
Then you make them overlap each other so that you've got areas like that where the one is going over and, or even inside the other one. Let's make this one here even more, even more like that. Let's maybe put a another guy over there. So with acrylic, you'll, you'll find that your white does often tend to dry um, transparent. So I'll come back and I'll strengthen some of them like that. Give them a second round, a second coat. up in this facility here it's not too much opportunity for us to to do because it's really light let's maybe add one or two in this vicinity over here as well i know the the flower is there there aren't really too many on the on the photo But we'll add a few anyway. Outside, going to the inn. Just like that. So that's not too difficult, eh? Easy. So here. So there you got to really make sure that you've got different transparencies effect it's really important And let's put maybe one more over here. Alrighty, so let's see. Maybe here this has dried off now a little bit, so we can give him an extra coat. So we'll give some of these flares an extra coat, just to just to strengthen them. said we're leaving him just uh, just round just on the edges let's maybe do a, a, a nice bright one over here just just as a point of contrast Okay, let's dry all this off and see what it looks like after it's dry.
Yeah, so what I've checked now is just to make sure whether they've uh, changed color on me. Because that's what acrylic does when it dries, eh? It changes color on you. Everything still seems fine. So I think I'm going to use a, a new palette for the for the flower. So let's do that. That seems to be roughly in position there, eh? Because now we need like pinks and stuff for our flower. So like I said, I'm just going to do my own thing with the flower because it's not a it's, it's not about the flower today. The lesson was all about the the bokeh effect. So I'm gonna take some what's that? Permanent alizarin. We just need a few different little colours. Let's see, maybe a cadmium red. Let's go with some orange. Yeah, and some cadmium yellow. Alrighty, I'm going to put some some titanium white down there as well, just so that we can tone down these colours slightly. And then those two are quite close to each other, right? So maybe I'll just darken that red up. Just squeeze a bit of crimson into him. You can always just take some of this guy and pop him in there as well. That's also an option. Alright, so take just a little bit of white and let's work it into there. My dear, is just to get these colours a little bit more pastel than what they what they are at the moment. Let's take that guy. A little bit more white into it than what we used for the, the crimson. And I feel the white will also just stop them from from darkening up on us as we go along. Let's take the orange. Work more white into it. And we'll take the yellow, we can leave him there, and put lots of white in it. Okay, so those who follow on nicely from each other, then that's quite a sudden jump to there, eh? So I'll take a little bit of this orange and just work him in there. Just so that we've got continuity between those guys. Now I can see they follow on from each other nicely. It makes sense. Sharon is asking whether I'm concerned that the hairdryer would warp the paper. I'm actually working canvas on, on, on canvas panels, Sharon, so I'm not working on paper today. Um, I'm not a big fan to, of painting on the paper um, because they do buckle. Um, all right. Let's paint. Let's paint ourselves a tulip. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just use the knife to paint the tulip today. So we've got the tulip roughly in this vicinity of here. I think we'll put him around around a third. So now when you do that, you need to ignore.
than they before. So if you paint over some of your nicest little effects, that's one of those things. Because that's the way it would, would be in real life. So I'm going to pick up some, some of the dark red. And the way I pick it up is like this. You're going to take the paint, put it on a pile like that, and then you take the, the, the knife, hold it upright like this, and you drag it through the paint. And that way, you get a roll of paint. Maybe I can clean the knife completely and pick it up so you can see exactly where that paint is on the knife. Like that. Can you see there? So you've just got that, that little roll of paint that's on there, but it's, 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 it's generous. I'm not being stingy with the paint whatsoever. And I'm going to do that for all these, all these strokes that I'm going to do now as I paint the tulip. So now you can see, let's maybe even zoom in on that guy a little bit. So you can see you've got that little center guy at the back, and then there's a, a leaf here, or a petal here, and a petal here. Linda's asking if you can do this in oils. Absolutely. All right, so in this guy, our sun seems to be coming from the right to the left. If I look at this guy over here, he's darker this side and he's lighter that side. So let's maybe put down a little bit over there, just as a tip of that center petal. Let's get a bit of red. So now I'm just picking up that same roll, but just on the tip because it's a it's not a large it's not a large petal that. I wipe off the knife on my paper towel. Pick up the next color, wipe off the knife, pick up the next color, and let's maybe put some of that down. Over there like that. Wipe off the knife so that it's clean every single time. And now I'm going to just gently wipe over these guys, just to give them a, a very basic little blend. Just using the tip of the knife, that's good enough. When you're painting with a knife, things are, are nice and rough. Okay, now I'm going to pick up quite a bit of paint, because now we've got a, a much bigger petal on this side. So I give myself a good little angle over there. Can you see on the photograph? There's quite a bit of an angle over there. So I'll do that. And I'm going to work on that. That sort of shape. That edge shape. Of that petal. And get him in there like that. Okay, let's wipe off the excess there. On that, that guy. Pick up some more. I just want to get a feel for where does that central bit end. So here we have a petal that's coming down somewhere like that. Because that ne needs to go into the center, right? So now that we've got that there, now we can bring all this down. So I'm just dragging them down over where they need to be. So that that entire area there is is covered. Now we know we're good to go. Okay, so let's continue with that petal. Let's let's paint him because he's he's behind this one over here. So now I'm going to go over to the red. Put some red down. Clean the knife. Pick up some orange. Put some orange down. Let's take a look. We take some of this dark and bring him down to the bottom of the of that petal. Now I'm going to take these colors and just 
roughly work them into each other. So it's not really a shading shading, it's just as you go over, these colors do mix and that gives you a bit of a a really rough shading. Okay, let's take some of this guy. So he is here mostly on this little edge over there. So I'll just use the tip of the knife to bring him on that edge over there. And then he comes around there like that. And the other petal overlaps him, so I'll stop there. Just use the tip of the knife just to work that in so that we've got a little bit of a shading there. That's good enough. Okay, it's back to the dark for the other petal. So here was just that. I've got permanent lizard in here with a bit of white in it. So we'll mix up a bit more. All right, so let's get this petal in. It comes in there like that, around there. And I'm letting this paint lie on top of the previous guy. Let's clean the knife. Add some red. So the sun is coming from this side. So now we're going to start gradually lightening up this side of the this side of the petal, like that, to around there. I'm going to just gently work these in. See, every time I clean my knife, after every little bit of stroke or whatever, I'm cleaning the knife. Let's just gently rub over there, just to get a bit of a blending going on there. Clean the knife, rub over the crimson and the and the red, to get a bit of a blending going in there. And I'm going to just darken up that underside, because the sun's here. So as this guy curls around, less sun gets in. Over there, and you can see it on the photo. Just a little bit of red as well for a transition color between the 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 purple and the orange. I'm just using the tip of the knife as before. I'm just gently blending these colors now into each other. Okay, let's take some of the highlight color. And we'll pop it down along that edge over there. So normally I would say suggest now is turn your turn your um turn your canvas to get these blended into each other because now you're working in the wrong direction. I can't do that, so I'm just using a smaller knife.
Alrighty. Now let's see. We've already got sap green and raw umber for that for that stem. So I'll just take some some of this. Some of that. Just work them together to get like that. Bit more of a dull dull green, a bit of white in it to get it grey. So now I'll spread that paint down flat so that I can pick up a nice long roll on this. And we'll work in that stem over there. Let's get another darker version of that. So lots more raw umber in the mix. This time I need to pick up a roll on the other side so that I can work just on this edge over here. So I'll put down just a little shadow over there. And now we'll take some yellow and some green and some white and just mix up a little highlight. Yeah, it should be good enough. I think there's enough contrast there. Okay, now I'm picking it up so that the roll is on that inside edge of that little stem over there. I'm just going to add that little highlight in there. Yeah, we've got a little bit of paint left, so what the heck, I'll take some of this and just add maybe just a, a suggestion of a leaf over there. Yeah, so it's stand back over there like that. So obviously, if you uh, if you want to paint the the flower more more detailed, go for it. Didn't want to put in too much effort with the with the flower today. But uh, just blend that little piece in over there, right? Eh? The flower wasn't the, wasn't the idea for today. It was getting that background right. But now that I stand back, you can actually see the effect quite nicely. Hey? So you can use this to um, really make your, your focal point stand out quite nicely because it pushes everything out of focus. And you can see it wasn't difficult to do. It's actually a, a really quick, easy and simple process. So if you did enjoy today's lesson, feel free to... Uh, join me on my website the link is on the on the screen there at the moment there i've got hundreds of lessons on my website in oil painting acrylic pencil drawing watercolor pastel pen and ink there's hundreds of classes there for a very affordable price and then obviously you get to uh, as a patron you also get to to download the references and the sketch templates and so on which helps you a lot when you when you're working with then it would also be great if you're watching me on uh, YouTube, if you can uh, do that for me. Because that way I can inform you when uh, I release new classes, when I'm going live again. Alrighty, so now you know how to do the bokeh effect. So if you're battling with a background that's giving you hassles that's too detailed and so on, now you know what to do. I'll see you next time.